Hello everyone, today we're talking about the Sicilian Shveshnikov, an opening which Magnus Carlsen himself has played many, many, many times with great success. And in the video today, we are going to be taking a look at all of the ideas, all of the moves that you need to know to play this opening. You're watching the Chesky channel, we upload videos every other day, so make sure you subscribe. Let's get into the video. So the Shveshnikov Sicilian is obviously a type of Sicilian defense, and so that means that it is an opening that you can play against e4. You go c5, they play knight to f3, controlling the center, we are going to combat that with knight to c6, and they immediately explode open the center with d4. In this position we take, knight takes, and we continue by developing our other knight. Now, we're already pressuring their pawn on e4, so they're going to play knight to c3. Uh, notice that they don't really have any other alternatives. If they try to take our knight and then go e5 and try to gain some space, this fails tactically to the move queen to a5 check, winning this pawn. So, going back indeed, knight to f6, knight to c3, and in this position we play the move e5, the move that defines the Sicilian Shveshnikov. It is an incredibly committal move. We are immediately structuring our pawns in a way that we can no longer change. This pawn cannot go backwards, which means that there's always going to be this permanent hole on d5. There's always going to be this open diagonal. But in exchange for these positional downsides, we're going to get quick initiative and very quick development. So how might this look? Well, the knight has to make a decision. Where does it want to go? It really only has one viable option, which is b5, but I quickly want to explore the other ones, which really are not too good. If they take our knight, we're going to take and very quickly play d5, gain space. We can also have access now for this bishop to leave through this diagonal, but also in some cases through this diagonal, this bishop can come to b4 and pin the knight. We're going to immediately take over the center with this move d5. This is great. If instead they play the move knight to f5, trying to target this d6 square, we're going to be able to quickly explode open the center with the move d5, opening up our bishop to hit the knight so that after they take, we take their knight, they take our knight. But this endgame position is quite good for us. Let's say king takes, we're going to be able to castle, hitting the king, bishop uh, to d2, let's say. But guess what? knight to g4. We don't even care about this pawn tension. They can take, we're going to take, we're going for immediate play. Let's say king to e1 to defend, only move actually, but now bishop to c5, you can no longer defend this pawn. We're, we are already in a great, very healthy position. So they can also go knight to b3 here, but this is really, really passive. It's not really in the spirit of the Sicilian Shveshnikov for white. We can continue by going bishop to b4. We're pinning their knight. At some point, we can still pry open the center with d5. Their pieces just went back and forth. And so we're better here. We have better development, good center control. And that takes us directly to the main move, which is knight to b5. Now, this move immediately aims to take control of the dark and weakened square on d6. So for example, if you go for the premature a6 here, they're going to put that knight immediately on d6. We're going to take and then they're going to take and situate a very dangerous queen in the center. Now, this isn't game over. In fact, we can go into an endgame now. We're kind of forced to go into an endgame now with queen to e7. And this position here, it's not terrible for black. It's roughly plus 0.5. White still has a lot of proving to do, but it's definitely not something that we want to invite. We moved our pieces backwards. We traded queens. We have definitely some weaknesses in this endgame position. You can notice this pawn is weak. Generally speaking, endgames are not going to be so good in the Sicilian Shveshnikov because our pawn structure has all of those positional weaknesses that I mentioned before. So going backwards, what we first play instead of a6 is the move d6 simply stopping knight takes d6 and next we're going to go a6. So for example, bishop g5, a6, we force their knight to move again and ladies and gentlemen, we go b5 here. And this is sort of the starting position of the Shveshnikov. We essentially um, gained a lot of space on the queen side. Again, there are weaknesses. This d5 square, a weakness. This d6 pawn, a weakness. This a6 pawn in some cases, a weakness. But in exchange, it is clear that we have some initiative and already some pressure. So what might this continue with? Well, first of all, they can choose to take our knight with the idea that after queen takes, they want to bring in the knight. This is actually quite bad for us. And so instead, what we end up doing is taking with the g pawn. 
It might seem a bit weird, why are we ruining our pawn structure? Well, the idea is we're trying to prepare the move f5. And after we get in an f5, for example, knight d5, f5, the position becomes far better for us. We first of all immediately put more pressure in the center. When the bishop comes to g7, it has a far better scope with the pawn no longer on, on f6. We also have this bishop potentially coming into the game if they choose to take. And for example, after bishop d3, we go bishop e6, we keep uh, adding more pressure. This is a very good position for, for black, nothing to complain about. So going back, instead of taking here, they can instead put their knight on d5. And their point is that they're trying to put more pressure on this pin piece. We're going to continue by going bishop to e7 here. We're defending the knight. Now, taking the two bishops here is not as good as it seems. We can simply take with the knight, and this position is very fine for us. We have f5 coming. If they try to keep the two bishops, well, guess what? The position is relatively closed. We can continue by adding more pressure to the center. So this isn't really a, a position that is common for white to go into. It's not objectively or practically good. Alternatively, they can choose to trade something like this, and they realize that they're giving us the two bishops, but again, the position is closed. They're gonna try to maneuver their pieces. For example, c3, and bringing the knight into the game. So what do we do? Well, this becomes kind of the main struggle in the Shveshnikov, where we're slowly going to maneuver and improve our pieces, and white is gonna do the same, and it becomes a question of who is going to do it better. So one of the key tips that I have here is to look at your pieces that aren't doing anything and improve them. This rook often comes to the b file, where it can, you know, in some cases help with the expansion of b4. This bishop comes and develops into the game. This bishop often comes to g5. It is stronger there. This is a great diagonal for it. You combine all of these elements together and you get something like this. Castles, rook to b8, bishop g5. You can go knight to e7, putting some pressure here. Uh, if they take, for example, we can then continue by taking with the queen, and after castles, we can wreck their pawn structure. So instead, uh, they'll continue by just immediately castling, but now bishop e6, we develop our pieces, takes, and then we can expand. And a position like this is generally quite good for us, because we've now gotten rid of a lot of our weaknesses in the d file, and further, our bishop is active, in the center, we have the only pawn in the center, we have more space, our queen can come in, help the bishop, and if you can certainly imagine if the queen, uh, if the bishop gets defended, and then the queen comes in, you can get some pressure on the d-file against the queen. This is generally speaking a great position for black. The final variation I want to mention is going back all the way to this position where, if you recall, they play bishop g5, well, they don't have to. They can also go knight to d5. Fabiano Caruana very much popularized this system where after takes, takes, knight to b8, uh, you can also go knight to e7, by the way. White essentially claims that they have the only developed piece on the board. Black is a little lacking in space. This can be continued with c4 for white. But as Magnus Carlsen many, many times showed, this position is very easy to navigate because although we, we don't look like we have that much space, we do. The knight can maneuver to c5. This bishop is wide open. This bishop can come through e7 along this diagonal. So if you see your opponent play into this variation, um, you shouldn't really fear that. And I can show this by looking at actually one of Magnus Carlsen's games. And you're going to see that he expands quickly on the king side with f5 and f4. He then develops his bishop to f5 very nicely tucked away here. It's a very beautiful uh, structure that he's building a6 to slowly stop this attack from white on the queen side, and now knight to d7, queen to c8, uh, we have takes takes, now knight to f6, the, the rook is defended by the queen, and you can see that, uh, I mean, black is quickly gaining space on the king side, and, and that's another important property, when this pawn got misplaced and it was put onto the d-file, that opened up the gates for us to just run uh, the opponent over on the king side. And that's exactly, again, what Magnus Carlsen does here. So I'll just let the position play a bit more. We reach an endgame position with some very interesting um, different you know, piece dynamics and, and piece placements. The rooks are quite active. We have more space. The knight is good here. The rook as well. And uh, you know, we're just more developed than the opponent. Uh, they go g3. We go f3, shut this down, keep the rook tied down here, an idea of maybe going e3 at some point. 
We have knight to e3. This was actually a stunning game indeed. Uh, notice that the, the rook is defended. And so, uh, and if they take, of course, there is mate. Very simple to see. Check and mate. So going back, uh, they decided after knight to e3 to go rook uh, f to e1. We get the other rook in, now using some back rank issues for them. Um, really gorgeous idea. Uh, if they take, notice that we can actually just take here and mate them immediately as well. Uh, they go h4, rook to d5, hitting the bishop. The moves themselves, maybe not so important, but the general idea, the general uh, nature of this game, I think, is what you should take away, which is one where black got all of the activity, all of the initiative, setting up attacks, you know, gaining space and really putting a lot of pressure on their opponent. And, and that is, I think, a great way to define this opening for black. It's a very um, aggressive one, very ambitious. And as you see in this position, it can certainly play, pay off very nicely. Beautiful mate in the end. Thank you guys for watching this video. Make sure you subscribe to not miss out on more content in the future. Like this video if you learned something new from it. And I'll catch you guys next time. Peace out.